Work really does matter. It really does matter. Um, and this series we're, we're sharing on, on uh, serving the Lord, both within his church and through our careers. And there's not a, a separation between the two. And so last Sunday, I shared, I started talking about what does Jesus think about work? Because you can't go wrong when you start with Jesus on a subject like this. Say, work? I, I, I'm here about church and let's talk about Jesus and church and ministry and worship and prayer. What's Jesus got to do with work? That's a separate part of my life. Well, that is not true. What does Jesus think about work? For those that were here last week, let me recap. And if you weren't here, as Tim said, you can check out the message on our app or on YouTube. And so I do that wherever I am across the world. If I'm missing a message, I just download, here Tim, here Cass, and, uh, and make sure I get the word of God in my life. So what does Jesus think about work? Jesus dignified work by the power of his own example. He was a carpenter and a good carpenter. He excelled in carpentry. In fact, he spent more time in carpentry than he did in ministry. About 15 years compared to about three and a half years. And so by his own life, and he had a good reputation, he was known as the carpenter of Nazareth. Secondly, when he started his ministry, in those three and a half years, he knocked around with all kinds of people. And he validated all types of careers by his embrace of ministry. <coughs> Excuse me, my wife gave me a lolly and it's choking me. <laughs> <coughs> Never do that again, sweetheart. It was a beautiful lolly, it was. I won't tell you. He validates all types of careers by his embrace of ministry. So the people he hung around with, some of them had careers that the rest of society said, whoa, keep away from those people, particularly tax collectors, sinners, in, in occupations that were not socially acceptable, but Jesus hung around them all, and he validated all types of careers, because he was dealing with issues of the heart, about their walk with, with God, and about living righteously in the right way with their fellow human beings. And thirdly, Jesus' heart is for all workers to act justly, to love mercy and to walk humbly through their careers, taking what the prophet Micah shared. You're going to preach on that tonight, Tim. Wonderful passage, great passage of scripture. And so, second question. So what does Jesus expect of all employees and employers? Now, most of us here are employees, yeah? Some of us are employers. In other words, workers and bosses. Who's a boss here? And you have staff. Lift your hand up high. Okay. Yeah, there's a few of us here. The rest of us are employees. There is a message for both of us. And the Apostle Paul, when he wrote his magnificent letters to the Ephesian Christians and the Colossian Christians, he's trying to articulate what Jesus would say if he was physically with us about a whole pile of life issues, marriage, relationships, raising kids, how you live in the world. And he talks about work and, uh, and he talks about the, how you function with those that are over you. And so I'd like to read this insightful passage from Ephesians 6, 5 to 9. Now remember, the Roman Empire, well if you're not aware of it, the Roman Empire was built by slaves. Slave labour. And if the Roman Empire had around, probably in that era, maybe 60 million people, I think the figures, I may be exaggerating it a little bit, but I think around a third to a half were slaves. Can you believe that? And, uh, and so uh, uh, slavery in Roman times, in the Roman Empire, was not like our modern day slavery. Uh, modern day slavery from the 1500s when the Portuguese and Dutch and the British and Spanish went and kidnapped people from Africa and took them to the Caribbean and South America and North America. It was uh, based on race and an attitude of racism and inferiority and so these people, you know, whites are superior so blacks just do all the work and, and so it's a revolting institution. 
And uh, thankfully, it was Christians that rose up and, and threw it off and, and got rid of it. In Roman times, it wasn't actually based on race. What it was based on was whether you were submitted to the Roman Empire and Roman authority. So if they conquered you as a people group and you willingly submitted and you didn't cause the deaths of Roman soldiers in fighting, well, they gave you liberty. But if you fought, they would enslave men, women and children. And so they would, so, so conquered peoples became slave labour and then they had an incentive by which they could get out of slavery by their obedience. So if they were obedient and good, then the slave master could in fact uh, give them their freedom, they could work for their freedom. And it was known that many, many slaves in fact did not want their freedom. And so when the bosses would actually give them their freedom, they would then choose to still w willingly serve that boss. And that's where we get the term bond slave. They had bonded themselves to that person because the boss was a good person. And so it was a, a unique institution, still rotten and not right. And ultimately the gospel of Jesus Christ overturned it as uh, uh, within really decades, uh, the, the death knell of, of that institution uh, was, was, was dealt with. So when Paul is writing here, he's writing to slaves, and I'm saying they're employees, okay, and to slave owners, masters, employers. So I'm, I'm, I'm taking the timeless, transferable principles that he talks about here because the workforce in the Roman Empire was based on this jolly institution. So um, he says this, slaves, employees, Obey your earthly masters with respect and fear and with sincerity of heart, just as you would obey Christ. Notice how he actually brings Christ in here. Obey them not to win their favour when their eye is on you, but as slaves of Christ, doing the will of God from your heart. Serve wholeheartedly as if you were serving the Lord, not people. Because you know that the Lord will reward each one for whatever good they do, whether they are slave or free. And masters, employers, bosses, treat your slaves in the same way. Do not threaten them, since you know that he who is both their master and yours is in heaven, and there is no favoritism with him. What an amazing statement. As we read that, I hope you could see the message, the timeless, transferable principles and truths that relate to all who would work, all who are bosses, all who are, are workers. And so Paul's focus here is to instruct the people on how to get on together now that they are Christians. And, um, and so this ethic that he introduces, where he brings Jesus in, is grounded, notice, in dignity and in quality, the equality of all people and the dignity of all people. This was anathema. This was the opposite to, to Rome's love of power and its abusive systems and including the institution of slavery. And so this would be the ruin of the institution of slavery if people took hold of it. So Paul was really a subversive, but he wasn't an outward subversive. He knew that if people came to Christ... And if they changed their paradigm and viewed people as everyone being equal, everyone having dignity, that ultimately it would change this, this social institution. It would get wrecked, and, and, and it did. Um, so the gospel of Jesus ushers in a new reality. It really does. That all people, all people, slaves, slave owners, can receive the grace and mercy and forgiveness of Jesus irrespective of their social status, irrespective of their personal behaviour. He doesn't say, well, you behave in a certain way, then you receive God's grace. No, God sent his son to show us what he was like and he dies on a cross, love personified, and said, I love you in your ungodly, in your, in your sinful state, separated from God, and I'm dying in your place. And so he didn't wait for us to change our behaviour or to change our attitude. His attitude was one of love. His behaviour expresses love uniquely as he dies on a cross for you and me. And so this is mercy. This is grace. All that we have to do is say thank you. That's faith. To say and receive, believe upon him and receive him and we experience the grace, mercy and forgiveness of God. It changed the world forever. And it's still changing cultures and societies across the globe. And it can change you today. It can transform your heart. 
You know, Paul's final piece of writing in the New Testament is a little letter. Uh, maybe you've read it, but you, it, it's sort of like there's Titus with a couple of chapters, I think three chapters. Then there's Philemon. Philemon, one chapter. And it's a beautiful letter that he writes to a slave owner. Interesting. He owned slaves. He got saved in the city of Colossae, which is in Asia Minor, just near, near Ephesus, sort of further inland. And Philemon was a slave owner, and he had a slave, and his slave's name was Onesimus. And Onesimus stole from Philemon. We don't know what he stole, but you know, what do you do when you steal from your slave master? And he finds out, you run. Okay, you run for your life because it's a capital offence. And so Anesimus, he takes off. Well, in the providence of God, jolly Philemon got saved, the slave owner. And then Anesimus, the slave, he got saved. So Paul becomes a dear friend to both Philemon and to Anesimus. And so he writes this letter to Philemon. And if you want to write a letter, and it's a really tricky situation of dealing with somebody that's been highly offended and you're trying to be a bridge builder, read Philemon. I mean, it's masterful. You won't get... I mean, Dale Carnegie wrote the book How to Win Friends and Influence People in the 1920s. I reckon he pinched Paul's style from Philemon. And uh, it's a magnificent letter. Like, he, he butters up Philemon, like he just says, Philemon, you're great, you're wonderful. Ooh, 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 ooh. He's just like, you always start off a letter by saying... You don't start off saying, Philemon, you're a bad boy. You want to punish Onesimus. Well, don't. He doesn't say that. He says, Philemon, you're wonderful. You're fantastic. But you know what he says? He says to him, he says, Philemon, you now are saved. And you have a master in heaven. Guess what? Onesimus also got saved. And, they, and you and he have got the same master in heaven. So therefore, you're brothers. The fatherhood of God causes the brotherhood of man. You both have a heavenly dad who loves you, saved you, and now you're brothers. And so he writes to him, and, and he basically appeals to him, though legally Philemon had the right to punish him, even punishment by death through the Roman authorities. But he actually says, now you're brothers in Christ. So therefore, love God, love one another, forgive and embrace. And, so, and that basically happened. So you can see that if the gospel penetrated the heart of a Philemon and Onesimus, and it caused them to, to see themselves as brothers in Christ, the institution of slavery was doomed. And it just shows you the power of the gospel to touch people. That gospel can touch you. Wherever you are, whatever your social status, whatever your, your personal behaviours, whatever your past, doesn't matter what you've done. Doesn't matter what you've done. And you may have sinned badly. And you may have hurt others and hurt yourself. And your, your conscience may be speaking to you saying you're a bad person. And that how could you be loved? How could you be accepted? Let me tell you, God loves you and he sees everything that you've done. But he doesn't see your sin, he sees your potential in Christ if you would give your life over to him. And he sees you as someone that can be forgiven of every sin. He sees that your past, there can be a line brought under it through the blood of Christ, and that you can be given a new name, your name, your birth name may be sinner, but your adopted name will be child of God, forgiven, loved, accepted. And that's what he sees. And it's not based on who you are and what you've done. It's based on who he is and what he has done for you. That's the gospel, that's the good news. And if you haven't received the good news of God's favour and love for you and offer of forgiveness, don't leave today without bowing your knee to Jesus. And uh, we'll give you opportunity at the end of the service, even to come forward, talk to one of the pastors, we can pray with you. Don't leave. He loves you. Let him love you. And I tell you, once you understand and experience his love and the forgiveness that brings, you will want to love him forever in return. Not because you have to, but because you want to. And so, so here we see in the story of Philemon and Onesimus a wonderful, powerful illustration of what the gospel can do in changing a human heart. And so this amazingly insightful passage that we've just read is so Christ-centered. In each of the four verses to do with employees, and most of us are employees, and maybe next week I'll talk about employers too a little bit, 
And, uh, but Jesus is mentioned in this passage. He says, just as you would obey Christ in verse 5. But as slaves of Christ, verse 6. Serving the Lord, verse 7. The Lord will reward you, verse 8. The Christ-centeredness of this instruction is striking. Because the slave's perspective will change. The employee's perspective will change. Your understanding of work will change when Christ is in the midst. Their horizons have been broadened. They've been liberated from the slavery of people-pleasing to the freedom of serving Christ wherever they are. Their mundane tasks have been absorbed into a higher preoccupation, namely doing the will of God from their hearts. Now let me read this to you in the message translation because... The older I get, the more I realise the English language changes. And so I started out reading, my first translation of the Bible was the King Jimmy version, uh, written in 1611. Beautiful, poetic, Shakespearean language. It's just marvellous. But language changes. Then I went to the Revised Standard version, because Dr Barry Chance said that's the best one. So I just obeyed Barry, but I found that a little bit technical. It's good. And then I went to the New International Version, then I went to the, the new, the, the, the life application Bible, the kind of the new life translation, and now finally the message. So I have my message on my table, both upstairs and at home. And so I love reading it because it's like reading newspaper English. And Eugene Peterson, a professor of New Testament uh, uh, of theology, he wrote this, or translated it, and it's just beautiful. So for some of you who struggle with the scripture, in understanding it. That's okay, so do I. I'm a modern man. I like to use modern language, so I use this as well. Have a listen now and read Eugene Peterson's The Message compared to what I just read to you, which is a great translation, the, the, the New International Version. This is what Dr. Peterson says. Servants, respectfully obey your earthly masters, but always with an eye to obeying the real master. Christ. Don't just do what you have to do to get by, but work heartily as Christ's servants doing what God wants you to do. And work with a smile on your face. Isn't that good? Always keeping in mind that no matter who happens to be giving the orders, you're really serving God. Good work will get you good pay from the master, regardless of whether you are slave or free. Masters, bosses, it's the same with you. No abuse, please, and no threats. You and your servants are both under the same master in heaven. He makes no distinction between you and them. Do you get it? Do you really get it? I think he says it in language. And may God's word cut through to us. I want to open this up, particularly next week, sort of phrase by phrase and, and share. But, but let me make a few comments now about this. In the New Testament... Whether, starting with Matthew right through, Matthew's gospel all the way through to the book of Revelation, there is no sacred secular division. Okay? There is no clergy laity division or kind of uh, basis or barriers. Um, sacred means this. What we do for Jesus through his church, that is sacred, okay? And some people view that as saying, okay, this is the sacred work of ministry through his church. And the secular is what we do for ourselves through our occupation. And, and many Christians do view it that way. What I do for my, through my occupation is, is about me and taking care of my material needs. It's disconnected from Jesus and, and the sacred is what I do in church when I do. So it's on Sundays it's sacred. In, in small groups on a Wednesday night or Friday night with youth, it's sacred. Okay, Sacred space. This is a sacred space. And, and in some church traditions, the building becomes a separated sacred space that you can't even enter into that building or walk on certain... Areas. Now, we don't hold that view. I mean, I experienced that personally when I got kicked out of the Church of the Holy Sepulchre last year because I was wearing shorts. Can you believe that? Can you believe that? Because somehow my hairy legs were offensive to somebody. And I got a good pair of legs. So what is that? 
It's that sacred space. So you've got to respect that it's a sacred space and therefore holiness has to do with how you dress. Okay? Now, we believe in modesty. We believe in, in, in being responsible. But there's no such thing in the New Testament as the sacred secular division. That's Old Testament. That's all been done away with. There's no clergy, somehow the clergy, oh, Pastor Bill, you're, you're, you're so much closer to God because you're, you've been called to lead the church. Not necessarily so. You can be as close, if not closer. Because there's no separation between, in our relationship with God, is we all have the same Jesus. We all have the same Holy Spirit. We're all on talking terms with God. He can speak to us. That's why we say when we operate gifts of prophecy and we believe in prophetic power when we're, and, and the gift of prophecy where someone receives something from God and inspires a person and, and speaks it and it can be amazingly revelatory and confirming, we say, you know what? The prophet should say it but not try and implement it. So uh, it's like, why? Because what that person may say, the person receiving it may say, well, that's okay, but I think God is telling me to do this. Well, Agabus in the book of Acts, he does, a, he's very dramatic, so he's a prophet. So he takes Paul's belt in, in, uh, in you can read the book of Acts, and he does a little dramatic action, falls on the ground, ties himself up, and goes, this is what's going to happen to the man who owns his belt. Like, pretty dramatic. Imagine that, someone coming and taking my belt off and locking them, this is what's going to happen to you if you go to Jerusalem. And everyone's going, oh, 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 the prophet. You know, Paul says, yeah, look, I know what's going to happen. Goes, don't break my heart, guys. Goes, I know what Jesus has said to me. So some people view that and say, oh, therefore Paul must have backslid because he got arrested in, in, in Jerusalem. No, no, he's just free as a priest under God. There's no clergy lady distinction. The prophet speaks, but it's up to him to make up his mind to obey. And so he felt the Lord say to him, you've got to go to Jerusalem. The prophet actually picked up that trouble would be there and told the truth, but he didn't direct Paul. And so, so we say, hey, clergy laity, there's no distinction. You hear from Jesus. You've got to take his direction. You're filled with the Holy Spirit like I am. There is a role for leaders and pastors to be able to guide and lead the, lead the flock. But they can never be Jesus in your life and would, would, would not want to be. That's awful. So in the New Testament, there's no sacred secular division. There's no clergy lady separation. Martin Luther said it. Now, Martin Luther, it's 500 years since he grabbed his 95 thesis, you know, his document, and he nailed it on the church door at Wittenberg, October the 31st, 1517. That date is probably the most significant date of the last 500 years. That kind of unleashed an amazing reform movement. And he would probably be regarded as the most influential, or has been in, in some quarters, influential person of the last 500 years. You, you Google Martin Luther. We'll do a series on him at the end of the year, sort of on, on, on the key teachings. And, uh, and Luther said this in one of his statements. Away with the laity. And people go, Dr. Luther, what do you mean away with the laity? Because he's an Augustinian monk, Catholic monk. And he launches the Protestant Reformation and says, okay, he goes, he goes away, with, away with the laity because we're all clergy. He says, forget this thing of separation, priests and people. He goes, we're all the people of God. You don't need a priest anymore to introduce you to God. You just need Jesus to be your mediator between God the Father and you. He covers your sin. He introduces you to God the Father. He sends the Holy Spirit. And so the role of priests and pastors changed under Luther, under a system that was up to that point of time where the priest and, and the political powers were united together. And so he broke through this thing. And so today we, we accept this. There's no clergy lady distinctions, no sacred secular division. It's, it's all about serving Jesus wherever you are and whatever you're doing. Here at church and at work. No difference to your attitude and behaviour here on a Sunday morning in your home group should be no different to how you interact with your wife this afternoon or your kids tomorrow night or your work or your university. He goes, it's just wherever you are and whatever you're doing, we are serving Jesus. Jesus Christ. So when you're doing home duties, right, okay, girls, you're the home duty people, not the men. 
gee, that's pretty soft on you. I thought you would have booed me down and kind of, you know I'm teasing you. Hey, look, I am, that looks actually true. When I started, when I got married, ethnic Greek male, sport by his mum, she did everything for him. I mean, I, I just expected the same for my wife. She just did everything. And, and actually, she complied and did it. Amazing. Then she got wise. <laughs> and started seeing the scripture. Hey, now I do my own washing, my own cleaning, my own cooking. <laughs> hey, you want to make a bet? I can do the best omelette in the world. It's this thick. It's beautiful. Better than what Kath makes. And... Uh, <laughs> So, if you're doing home duties, fellas, girls, cook your meal as if Jesus was going to eat it. Clean your house as if Jesus were to be the honoured guest. I had the, my three grandkids over for breakfast yesterday morning, and I'm cooking my famous eggs, and, and, uh, and Vasily, he says, I want to break this up. So he wants to break the egg and put it in there, and so he, he, he breaks it. I said, now, now, just, just open it. He just puts his hand straight through it. <laughs> so the egg flowed through his hands, and I'm thinking, Lord knows where that hand has been. <laughs> oh, Jesus, protect me when I eat this thing. <laughs> and there were bits of shell in there. And, I mean, we are... We could not serve that to Jesus, could we? We want to do it to the best of our ability. Cook your meal as if Jesus was going to eat it. Teachers, and I was a teacher, and I loved teaching. I taught for three years in the high school sector. I wish I could have taught up to 10 years. But the church was growing, and, and the needs were great, and uh, they needed my, my attention in leadership and preaching duties and pastoral stuff like that. Um, but I'll tell you, I love teaching. And uh, I, I view teaching that I'm educating Jesus' kids. They're his kids. They're not my kids. They're his kids. I want to educate them like they're his kids. Doctors and nurses, and we've got heaps of doctors and nurses, caring for the sick. You are doing Jesus' will. I mean, how often did he heal the sick? Did he care for people? Because these areas of the care of kids and the care of education and, and health are two of the primary needs. If I had my way, I'd pay doctors and teachers and nurses twice what they're on now. And I'd cull half of them who don't love it, they just do it for the money. And I want to find out if they're called to be a doctor, called to be a nurse, called to be a teacher. Do they really love the kids and love their patients or do they just want the money? I'd sack half of them and get those that are called and pay them twice as much. That's why I would never get into politics or be in that realm because it would be chaos. <laughs> Lawyers who are helping their clients. Shop assistants serving customers. Secretaries who are, who are typing letters. I've got a new personal assistant. Her name is Esther Lane. She is fantastic. I said to her the other day, you see, you hear Lester, Esther, you're the best. You're better than Janet Bryce. You're better than, than Cassie Pidd. You're better than all of them. And she doesn't believe me. <laughs> hey, where would, we be without, where would I be without having assistance of people who are skilled in administration? I'd, I'd fall over. Having had Janet and Cassie and now Esther, amazingly gifted people, and they serve Jesus through this. They're not serving me. They're, they're serving Jesus with the gifts that they have. If you're a storeman or a storewoman carrying goods, if you're a mechanic, you know, fitting appliances, I mean, uh, do it as if you're doing it for Jesus. You're fixing up his car. You're fixing up his appliance. In each case, you are serving Jesus Christ. A sacred and secular mentality says I serve God on Sundays at church and I'm serving my boss and myself for the rest of the week. And Jesus does not condone this view. It's not what he expects. God has placed us in our jobs to burn bright for Jesus, to do it to the best of our ability. And as the opportunity uh, comes, as we add value to that work environment and add value to the boss and our fellow workers by the excellence of the quality of our work, he opens up doors by which we can share the life of Christ and what a difference Jesus has made to our lives. Paul says this in Romans 10. He says, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. 
If you're out there working every day, you have beautiful feet. That's what Paul says. Because those feet, as you go to your places of work, he goes, you bring Jesus with you. And, and you've got good news about him, that he can save and touch people's lives. And though you must be respectful of your work environment, you pray that God will give you opportunities by which you can let the light shine. Let them see it by your good life. And, and, and when the opportunity arises, share it. And I've seen over the years, magnificent people here in the church. I mean, I'm awed by, by the people here in the church that I've observed who have done this so well, who uh, don't see any sacred secular division, don't see any clergy laity d differentiation. They serve the Lord in the church and seamlessly they serve the Lord in their work and they achieve there. And I've, I've observed lots of people and I've asked two of them to come forward to come and share with me. Come on, Liz Heinrichsen and David Hersey, grab your microphones and come. These are magnificent people. I've known Liz for 30 years. I've known Liz for 30 years. I've known David for about 46 years. And uh, Liz uh, has served the Lord with us here in so many different roles. Beautiful. What a wonderful leader. And she served the Lord as a teacher and, and has worked her way through to being like in charge of uh, probably one of the largest schools. There's three of them or so in Australia, uh, out in, in Gawler. And uh, she personifies what I think is somebody who there's a seamlessness between serving God in the church and serving God in her work. David Hersey uh, joined the public service when he's 17 years of age. He, uh, he retired a few years ago, I think 50 plus years, Dave, like he ran the public service in South Australia, no, no, the health department. And he uh, succeeded and went all the way up into a top administrative role. And all the way through, his witness and his life was astounding. Um, the number of people that he impacted with the gospel and it's not one or the other. So I've asked, So they personify that. I thought I'd get a couple of the, 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 the more senior people share, and then next week I'm going to get a couple of young people to share who maybe don't have the 40 years experience. But Liz, could you tell us a little bit about what you do at work and, and this thing that I'm saying about the seamlessness? How, how have you served God in the teaching area? Because I've been a teacher for a few years. Um, okay. Um, really, Bill's covered everything that I was going to say anyway. Um, with, with his um, message to us today. I, as a Christian, see myself as somebody who is in relationship with God every day. And every part of my life and everything about me should reflect that. And so there is absolutely no difference between, or should be no difference, between the Liz you see here on a Sunday, the Liz you see at school on a Monday, or at a parents' meeting on Wednesday, or at a home group on Saturday, because it is the same person. And in every one of those instances, I should be reflecting the love of God in what I do. So um, I just don't get the fact that there would ever be any difference at all. Um, in my work, in my, um, in my role here, very much I'm wired as an encourager. And so that just naturally is going to flow whether I'm in a classroom, whether I'm in the yard, whether I'm talking again to parents or to other teachers. It's just going to automatically flow out from who I am. And I just love um, Eric Little in The Chariots of Fire, which all of those people much younger than me would never have seen and not known what I'm talking about. But Eric was um, an Olympic runner, gold medalist, and he was also a missionary and his sister was chastising him because he wanted to run. And he said, when I run, I feel God's pleasure. I've got to say, when I'm in a schoolyard talking to a child, I absolutely feel God's pleasure. When I can put a smile on someone's face in a schoolyard, I get that God is smiling as well and feel that really big time. Now, you know, you might be thinking, well, it's okay for Liz, she's in a job where she can do those things. But I believe you can do them everywhere because, you know, I can put a smile on someone's face in a supermarket as well. I can put a smile in someone's face when I'm buying petrol in my car. So it really is got to be who we are and it doesn't make any difference. Um, my personal integrity, therefore, is really, really important to me. If I'm going to 
be um, a witness for God everywhere. It's got to be everything about my life that is looking as though um, it's authentic. So I can't be sitting in a staff room at lunchtime talking about the fact that I might have been at church on Sunday and then being really dismissive to a staff member or rude to somebody in the office because that's not going to ring true for anybody. So it you know, really puts you in a position, but hopefully it's who we are anyway, where we're authentic, that every part of our life at any minute, whether somebody's watching us or not, is reflecting who we should be. A couple more things, and then I'll hand over to you. Look, um, Francis of Assisi says, you know, preach the gospel at all times, and if it's really necessary, use words. And, you know, very much to me, that's how I need to operate on a daily basis. I did at one stage, you know, I, you start to wonder and you get moved by God, um, well, all the time. And I was in a, um, at a conference where Jackie Pullinger was speaking and I'm thinking, God, is there more that you want me to do? What is it? You know, is there something else? And I got Jackie to pray for me. And it was just fabulous because um, you know, when I'm being prayed for, this is the only time I've actually had a vision and seen something. And all I could see was a sea of those little blue um, sun hats that the kids have to wear at school at playtime. And that gave me a real confirmation that, um, yeah, look, Liz, you know, what you're doing, what you're being paid well to do, <laughs> um, is actually the work that I want you to be doing for me. And I guess the other thing is when you um, are working in this in a secular setting and when you clearly see that you're there for God and it's where he wants you to be and what you want to be doing, you get a real joy out of every day and you get a real joy out of your job. I work with, you know, there are... I'm not the head of the, the whole thing, Bill, only a section of it. And I work very closely with three other people in a similar position to me. We would meet together every four or five weeks. They don't do the same job as I do. I, clearly, they have got staff who are awful that they complain about all the time. They've got kids who are really difficult to work with that they are complaining about. And they've got parents who give them the worst time in the world. I don't have any of those experiences. The place I work in is so different to theirs, even though it's identical. And it's because I go and I see that place as somewhere that God's put me. And I also see those people I work with through his eyes. Yeah. Liz, um, Liz has always impressed me. And uh, as someone who exemplifies um, what I've been sharing, I think the other thing, I mean, I know you, you see yourself as having a gift of encouragement, and that's obvious. I would also see you've got a gift of leadership. And uh, if God didn't call you to lead in the education, I reckon you could lead a church very successfully because you're a very good leader. And she did a course um, with us many years ago called Leadership Excellence. We went through Dr. Stephen Covey's Seven Habits and other books. And uh, one of the comments Liz made to me years afterwards, she goes, I've taken that stuff and I've actually used it in the school sector. So the principles that we use for leadership within the church, she's used within, within the school. And so there is no division, you know, you, you've got to be who you are. And I think the fact that you sense God's smile and his pleasure in what you do, you've been a magnificent servant here and also in the school sector. Uh, but not to be outdone, uh, David Hersey is also a legend. David, share with us, you've been a public servant. Now, now public servants get bad rap, Dave. Uh, but you are the best public servant I have ever met in your attitude to work and service. So share a little bit about your journey of how you serve the Lord through the public service. Thanks, Bill. Um, it is true that um, um, Colossians talks about the fact that uh, don't just do the minimum the that will get you by, do your best. Being a follower of Jesus doesn't cover up bad work. Keep in mind always that the ultimate master you're serving is Christ, which, in fact, Bill's been sharing about this morning. It is true that, um, um, that uh, I've been in health for those 50 years uh, and uh, moving from various sections, so it wasn't just in one particular department. But in the early years particularly, I guess as a new Christian, 
very enthused and very uh, excited by the, the things of God. And uh, I, I guess we had a, a fantastic youth program in Sturt Street Church. And uh, I would just come in uh, in the morning tea breaks. I was very aware that uh, as a, an employee that I should be responsible to my boss, to my director, to my manager, and certainly not to uh, use the boss's time to preach or to, in some way, um, use that time to influence people. But there was always morning tea breaks, and uh, certainly, um, often, it would be that uh, we'd talk about what happened on the weekend. And so I remember people, uh, one person uh, initially asking me, so what do you do on the weekend, David? I said, well, on Saturday, blah, blah, blah. and on Sunday morning, uh, I'm at church. Uh, oh, you go to a church? Oh, really? And often it started from there. So it was lunch times and morning tea, afternoon tea breaks. Of course, that's true in public service. We do have morning tea breaks and, you know, that's the, the typical thing in public service. But it is true that um, uh, in the, my initial early years, it ended up that we had eight or nine um, of us that were Christians. One by one, they seemed to be finding the Lord. And uh, I used to talk about the youth program of a, a Sunday night, uh, a Saturday night, and uh, uh, they were great days. And I remember one girl that was the most popular, uh, influential girl in that whole area. Uh, one day she said to me, David, can anyone go to these youth meetings? And I was so shocked. I think, wow, she wants to go. So I arranged for, for that to happen. And uh, I tell you what, I think also it wasn't my little words here and there. No, no, I guess I also prayed. I knew the Lord was doing the work. And sometimes people say, oh, but you're responsible for Ray Betcher. You're responsible for all those others that, that came to Christ in that period. I say, no, no, I reckon Ray had a wonderful mum who prayed for him. Certainly I prayed for him. And there was the fruit that happened. The Holy Spirit was at work in those uh, good people. So they were great days. And over the years, I guess I've seen similar things happen where unexpectedly they'd come to my office and say, David, I've become a Christian. And I think it wasn't just me doing that. It was certainly other influences. So I think the body of Christ, as we work together, in spreading the, the good news of Jesus, it happens. And we do it respectfully. You know, if anyone comes, uh, we, the scriptures talk about this in Peter, that uh, if anyone asks of you the, the reason for the hope that you have, you share it with them respectfully and gently. And I think that's the case, that we don't preach at people, but we can certainly just... Hold high that testimony yeah, of God's grace in our lives. So exciting days. And, and uh, certainly, even in my latter years, I've seen people who uh, have just been influenced. You know, some people have a, a really anti-religious feeling. A man that I worked closely with, uh, one day he sneezed. And he said, oh, bless me. And then he said, oh, I shouldn't have said that because I'm not religious. Well... I laughed with him, and uh, he was promoted to a further position, but uh, every now and again he'd come and talk, and one day he came to me and said, David, uh, can I just talk to you privately? Over in the conference room. I said, yes, that, that'll be fine. He said, I'm not telling anyone else, anyone else. I, I just want it between you and me in, in this environment. He said, uh, you're a man of faith will you pray for me? And I said, yes, of course. He said, my marriage has just broken up. He was a man, wealthy person, with parties. You know, often there was talk about these, this, um, you know, the, the, the lifestyle they had, very wealthy people. But then he comes to me mm. and says, David, you're a man of faith. Will you pray for me? And it was like, Wow. He was a man who was saying earlier, oh, I'm not religious. Mm. But in fact, there was an inclination to, to seek help. Yeah, uh, and so I'm just very grateful that yeah. God 
does lead us and guide us that we can be a strong witness um, in our workplace with care, with gentleness, and uh, we see God will receive the glory out of all of that. Yeah, wonderful, David. That, that's great. And, um, yeah, very good. I, the other interesting thing is you notice their humility that they achieved, have achieved in life. They've been successful. They've been promoted. And, and yet it hasn't been a blind, selfish ambition. It's an ambition for Jesus. It's an ambition to do the best they can with the gifts that they have. And it's just interesting when you do that, that promotion comes from the Lord. And uh, so you exemplify what it means to be a true worker in the church and in the community. And so there's that seamlessness. If it wasn't for David, I don't know where I would be because when I came to Christ, uh, the person who brought me to faith and then the person who I led to faith, my first convert, were heroes of mine. And I, I was had a, quite, a, quite a sense of inferiority compared to them in relation to their spirituality. Anyway, they both fell away for, for a season and, and I, I still love them and still talk with them and, and pray for them, but I was on my own in the church. But David, though he was a few years older, he kind of nurtured me. So here he is serving his pastoral gift operating in the church, also who he is operating within that group within uh, the, the public service, and so uh, I'm very thankful. And David's been uh, a long-term board member of the church. He's probably our longest-serving man. He threatens every so often that he might, now that he's in his early 70s, that he might want to come off. But I want him there when he's 95. So, uh, <laughs> and uh, but uh, both both you and Liz have really um, been exemplary witnesses, and and we look up to you guys in many ways. And I think they're they're worthy. Uh, of our respect, and so we honour them, and thank you for being a witness. Put our hands together as they take their seats. Praise the Lord. Let's stand together, church.